So welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. Today, we're continuing on with chapter 14, and we're walking through the verses 16 through 20. Uh, The last couple of weeks have been really good, and we're about ready to wrap up this book. So if you've been following along with us and you have the Michelet, then you'll note that uh, we are about ready to be finished with volume one of the Michelet. This is the book. We use this book along with the Passion Translation to go through a lot of the scriptures. And uh, the Michelet is actually broken down into two volumes. And so if you don't have the second volume yet, I would highly suggest going ahead and getting the second volume now, because uh, within the next couple of weeks, we'll be starting on the second volume of this. I don't think we have but another... uh, Oh, a little longer than that. Sorry. A little longer than that. So you got about a month. Just bear that in mind, because uh, we still got chapter 15 to go through as well. Uh, just wanted to let you guys know, uh, if you want to look and and uh, grab a hold of some of the books, there is a link in the description below for those of you that are watching on YouTube. And while I'm at it, and since I'm talking about this right here, right now, Let me also say that we have a live class. And if you'd like to be a part of the live class where not only do we have this time of teaching like we're having right now, we also have an engagement time afterward. That engagement time is not recorded. And it's just for those who come in here and are a part of the class itself. So that's where we begin to discuss. We begin to break down. It's kind of a one-on-one with not just questions and answers, Question and answers is fine, but it's also engaging with one another and finding out, well, what are you? what is the Lord showing you about this? How does it apply to you? Because we begin to learn from each other and we begin to uh, really, if you will, fulfill that scripture in another way than the way that we used to see it. What do I mean by that? To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, Right. And I, rem- and, and I know that my father is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. But wait a minute. Is not father in you? Is not father in me? So that means when we have this time of being able to engage together, then we are sharing of the treasure of God that he has shown each and every one of us. So truth be told, I am receiving from father, the father in you. You are receiving from the Father, the Father in me. Now I can see from a whole nother perspective this place of him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. Make sense? Yeah. Kind of a different way of looking at it, isn't it? But it it really kind of makes sense when you stop to, to look at it. All right, so verse 16 now, I'm going to be reading from both the Michelet and the Passion Translation. I'll be, although, uh, as I was studying this and preparing for today's class, I'm really going to be spending a lot of time in the Passion Translation. I love the way that Dr. Simmons translated these verses into the Passion Translation. Verse 16 in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 14 says this, A wise man fears and turns away from evil, but a fool becomes enraged and is confident. In the Passion Translation, Dr. Simmons says this, A wise person is careful in all things and turns quickly from evil, while the impetuous fool moves ahead with overconfidence. To me, that's a, a, a beautiful rendering of that particular scripture because it, it begins to talk about this place of, of a wise person or a righteous son. See, sometimes you can... Uh, uh, They are two different things. Wisdom and righteousness, to a great extent, are two different things. But in the place where one who is wise is usually one who is righteous or is one who is righteous. And so they almost become synonyms of each other with regards to that, even though they mean two totally separate things. And I know for me, one of the things that the Father has taken me into And many of you have heard me say this for a long time now, that I'm very focused. And the Lord took me into a place where he brought me 
to where I became very, very focused about things. In other words, uh, if, if I didn't quite know how to respond to something, or if I was in a situation where I wasn't quite sure what I needed to do or how I needed to do it, then I would get very quiet. Now, not to the point of getting, of, of not acting. If it was something that I needed to make a choice about and it needed to be right away, then I would listen to the peace inside of my heart. Of course, if it was somebody trying to force me to answer a question that I just, I didn't have the peace in my heart about, and they were telling me I had to give an answer right then, right now, the answer is always no, period. If you're going to force me to make a decision right now, I'll give you my answer. No, because I need time to think about it. I don't care what you think. Well, it's it's right now's the time. You got to do it right now. I don't. Thank you. I appreciate it. And and uh, and walk away from from that situation. But there's other times where we have to make a decision one way or another. And we we go with the peace. So I'm not talking about inactivity here. I'm talking about just that place of being. Very careful. As Dr. Simmons wrote in all things that we do. As I was meditating on this, Father began to mess with me because in the Mishle, it says this. Rashi himself, Rashi, one of the commentators, says this. A wise man fears punishment and turns away from evil. Well, I agree with that to a great extent. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think there's something even deeper than fearing punishment. Because if I stop to think about that, if a wise man fears punishment, then the look, though the way that the person is seeing is a punishing God. And our God is not a punishing God. He loves. Matter of fact, as we wish, as we've gone through the, pro, uh, the the Psalms and the Proverbs, one of the overriding themes that we began to see as we've gone through each one of those was this place of of actually Father saying this: Your own decisions bring about your own judgment. God loves us, and He's given us everything that He needs to, to for us to be able to make a choice to do something. But our own decisions that are outside of this place of his perfect will for us, will it's not his punishment that's coming against us. It's our own choices that have caused the punishment. Does that make sense? Now, some of you may be like, oh, wait a minute. That just that doesn't fit. Well, no, it doesn't fit with this this. This God who lives upstairs, who's got a big bat that every time I burp in church, he's going to he's going to knock me with that bat. All right. Yeah, I'm being silly on purpose. Right. Because it's 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 not about that. He's a loving God. He walks us through these things. But our choices after knowing what is right, after what when we know what is right and what is wrong and we purposefully go towards that wrong thing, every decision Every choice has a consequence, both, if you will, good and bad. Now, those of you that know me are almost probably a little shocked that I'm even coming at it from that perspective, because both good and bad are both good. (laughs) Now, Now I got your attention, or you're probably clicking off, one of the two. Wait, hold on just a minute. Let me let me explain what I'm saying. Even when we make a choice that goes outside of that, that outside of the will of God, outside of that place of knowing what we know is right, that even that choice and the resulting consequences that happen because of that choice, the Father uses to bring us back to Him, to cry back out to Him. So even when we see things as good or bad, it is always good. Now, I know you're like, well, give me scripture on that one. Yeah, I I will. And it's one that you all know well. All things, all things 
work together to the good to them that love the Lord, right? All things, no matter what. I know in my own life, as the Lord took me through the many things that I've been through, one of the key things I discovered was just that, that I could look back at even those choices that I made that were outside of his will. In other words, they were they were nothing but to fulfill the desires of, of my own flesh, whatever it may be, food or blah, 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 just whatever it may be. Those things, and I don't even like using a list because I want Holy Spirit to reveal to you whatever that is, but you get the point of what I'm trying to say, that even those things have taken me back to where I look at them uh, not with regret, but with thankfulness, because they made me into who I am right now. Because I realized this place of standing in the presence of a holy God and not just walking in and acting like it's nothing. To walk and stand before a holy God, to have that place of the reverence of knowing that I am in and 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 remaining in that place of the presence of God. I know some of you who have been watching us for a while may be asking, well, you've got your Talit on today. Yeah, I do. And I want to start wearing this Talit uh, every time that I begin to teach. I haven't been doing it because I've been in my own home. And in my own home, I already have that covering. But Father has, has, has been prompting me to begin to wear the Talit and for me, it's a place of, of the secret place. It's an outward expression of it. The, the truth is, is the secret place is inside of me. And I can always go into that place and covered by the heart of God, covered by the wings of the Almighty. But there's an outward expression of that as well. And I've chosen to begin to wear that as an outward expression of the place of where I am on the inside, and that is inside of the secret place. And I don't have to leave there. So if I'm in the if I'm in the secret place in the presence of God every day, no matter what, then I'm standing before a holy God. No, no wonder the Lord has taken me on this, this journey where I've become so focused about things that I want to make sure. It's not that it's not even this place of because I know I know some of you may think and I've because I've heard this before. Well, I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Sometimes there are choices that we don't hear the audible voice of God as we're going into them. But each and every one of us know if we can remind ourselves, if you haven't felt it in a while, then go to that place of sitting before God and spend that time with him and find that place of peace. Find that place where the, the peace that passes all understanding covers and guards your heart and mind, that covers you. You begin to feel that peace and then grab a hold and never let go. Grab a hold of that peace. Kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. In other words, grab a hold of that peace just like a bulldog would on the end of a bull's nose. Hold on and hold on. No matter how much you're flipping and flopping around, hold on. Because that peace will be that place that will guide, that will, that will guide you. I know for me, when I've had to make that decision, that's where I've gone with is that peace. The scripture goes on to say, while the impetuous fool moves ahead with overconfidence. You see, in this, with what, the, what Rashi says, a wise man fears punishment and turns away from evil. Again, it's a, it's a perspective of a punishing God. I agree with this, but I believe the deeper expression could be this. A wise man loves and turns away from evil. I love the Lord so much. I know I cannot love him back except that he gave me that love first. Agreed. But out of my own choices, out of my own heart, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength is what it says in that particular scripture. 
that is my choice. And so I love you, Father. And a wise man loves and then turns away from evil because he loves. Come on. You guys have heard this. I've, I've used this, this same analogy last week when I said, let's look at, uh, at our husbands and wives. If you love your wife, will you not do something that shows that you love her? If you love your husband, are you not going to do things that you that shows that you love your husband? It's not, not just a matter of saying I love you. There's things that we do that can prove that love. Right? Sometimes this isn't just the little things. Sometimes it's in the romantic things where I struggle. <laughs> you know, I do the I do the things, but sometimes I struggle on the romantic side of those things. But I'm learning and I'm growing in that place, you know, and thank goodness my wife has been very uh, gracious with me because we've been married 38 years. So um, thank goodness for that. But you see what I'm saying? We all learn because why? Because I love, I love her. And if I love my wife in that, to that extent, how much more so loving the father? Make sense? So the Michelet goes on to say this, and I love what, uh, um, I don't know if it was the Vilna Gaon or uh, who wrote this. Let me look real quick. I want to give honor where honors do. But basically in the Michelet, it says this, I can't find it right now. Careful scrutiny and meticulous self-evaluation is characteristic of the righteous. Someone who's wise is going to look at things from more than just one side. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. I know we've gone to a great extent with wisdom, so I'm not going to go back to those, those talks. If you want to learn more about the wisdom, go back a couple of chapters where we really talked heavily about wisdom. But truth be told, go back and watch from the beginning of Proverbs because we've talked about it the entire time. And, and I love this because as, as we get wise, as we begin to learn, as we begin to know, then we're going to scrutinize the things that we do. We're going to look at, at something from a multiple multiple perspectives. And it's funny how you can kind of, as you do that, you begin to see where other people don't always do that. Now, that should never be in the sense of a judgment. That should never, ever be in the sense of a judgment, but it can be in the sense of learning. I can watch and say, mm, okay, Thank you, Father, that you're beginning to teach me, and thank you for allowing me to see this situation so that I may learn and, and avoid the, the pitfalls of what I'm seeing even right now. So self-evaluation, looking on the inside and seeing how we respond to something. You see, in a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about fear. And actually, in the Michelet, it says a wise man fears and turns away from evil. Now, that word fear there, one of the things that I have discovered, and I want to share with you guys, one of the things that I've discovered has been this place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I know many of us try to call it this place of honor and respect. And yes, absolutely. That's an absolute part of the spirit of the fear of the Lord and fearing the Lord. But I remember one day I was walk, I was doing something and it was very innocuous. Not, I wasn't really doing anything. I was, I was actually signing up for something on an app and uh, it had to do with um, some financial things. And I was signing up for something on an app and suddenly I had a spirit of the fear of the Lord hit me or a fear it was a it was an outright being almost shaking in my boots afraid why i don't know but it hit me suddenly and when it did i was like lord what in the world what is this where is this from i've done nothing there was nothing wrong with what i was doing i said what what is this sudden fear coming over me about and after a little while, I, I continued to pray and ask the Lord, and he told me, he says, this fear is not the fear that you think it is. Even though it feels like it, 
He said, I'm taking you to a deeper expression of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I'm taking you deeper into this. And I was like, but Lord, it sounds so much like this evil or negative fear. How could that be the case? But have there have you ever been in a place where suddenly you felt a an afraid? You became afraid and you did not do what you were thinking about you're about what you're <laughs> you did not do what you were thinking you were about ready to do and what you were thinking about doing. You suddenly stopped because suddenly there was this fear that encompassed you. And you were like, ooh, ooh, maybe, maybe I better not do this. And you backed off. You following me? That was the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Even what we call a negative fear is, is not really a negative fear. It's just a strong, gripping fear of the fear of the Lord. I know for me, I know that sounds crazy. I don't know that I'm even articulating it very well here. So Holy Spirit, I ask you are the great teacher. I know you asked me to speak about this. And so I'm, I'm giving it exactly the way that, that I have walked through it. But Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. So take what I'm saying here and allow all those that are here today to be able to understand the depth of what I'm talking about. There is another fear where it's the fear of man. But this is, I'm talking about the fear of God in not doing something that we're not supposed to. You see, that fear very well may have prevented you from stepping into something that could have caused damage or harm, but it hits you with a strong, what we call negative fear. Careful scrutiny and, and meticulous self-evaluation is a characteristic of the righteous. And there's nothing wrong with stopping and thinking about something before you enter into it. And to look at it from more than one perspective. Think about that. If we only see one perspective of something, it's not, it's not enough. Because even I have discovered with the 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 and those of who have been in our classes have also discovered that when we begin to talk about a Hebrew letter or a Hebrew word, that Hebrew letter and that Hebrew word, and even the very vowel sounds, the sounding of that Hebrew letter within that Hebrew word has meaning. And it has more than one meaning. So you can look at it from a multiplicity of ways and it teach, it's taught me, it's taught those in our classes, it's taught us how to look at things from more than one perspective and to make sure that we see them from those other perspectives. Why? Because it brings about wisdom. We're looking at all sides of something. Am I there yet? Have I, have I come to the place where I'm the, the wisest man in the world? No, no, but are, am I still, am I, is my heart inclined towards that? Yes. Am I, am I striving for that? Yes. Am I moving towards that? Yes. Do I make mistakes? Yes. But wait a minute. Oh, you make mistakes? Yeah. Yeah. I, I make mistakes. I do. But those mistakes teach me. So was it a mistake or was it a learning experience? How do I look at it? What, what do you see and how do you see it, right? Two questions that that any of anybody who's been in our classes know what know those two questions because I use them all the time. So when I when I quote unquote look at a mistake, is it really a mistake or was it a learning experience? Is failure really truly failure? Or is it a learning experience? You know, the old <laughs> I am going completely off of what I wanted to talk about here, but I'm, I'm here in Holy Spirit, bring this up. I, many, many people know that some people know this and some don't with regards to, uh, uh, oh, crud, what was his name now? Uh, light bulb dude. Um, what was his name? Oh, crud, help me out here. The guy that invented the light bulb. Help me out. Uh, I want to say I, Edison, Edison, Thomas Edison, yeah. Edison. Thank you. Thank you. My brain just went totally blank there. Uh, Thomas Edison. The, if, if 
when they asked him about the discovering the light bulb and how how they he was able to put this together, he said that he he failed ten thousand times or more before he found the right combination of the the way the bulb was supposed to be set up and the 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 actual uh, filaments that were used, the wires or the metal that was used for all that. It took him ten thousand tries. He knew it was possible. And he was unwilling to give up until he could find the right combination to to begin to create the light bulb. So was that 10? How many of us give up after two or three? And he went 10,000 or more with his trials. You following me? So be careful in all things. Don't give up so easily. Don't let fear rule you in the sense where you curse the devil about the fear when it very well could have been the presence of God and the spirit of the fear of the Lord in you that was either stopping you or propelling you to move forward. Sometimes it's both. I hope this is making sense today. Again, I moved in a direction that I, I hadn't planned on talking about, uh, but that's okay. Verse 17 says this, a short-tempered person acts foolishly, and a person of evil designs will be hated. In the, in the Passion Translation, it says, an impulsive person has a short fuse and can ruin everything, but the wise show self-control. Now we're back to that previous verse again, and what we talked about with that that previous verse. Let's let's discuss this because it, it fits right in line with what we were just talking about. An impulsive person is one who just immediately goes into it, more than likely only looks at it from one perspective, and that's the perspective of their own desires and the, their own desires of their own flesh and what they want to do. And so they, they have a short fuse. In other words, they pull the trigger very quickly in moving into something without really taking the time to look at all of the details. There is a time where that is is a good thing. But again, for me, I've got to, I've got to have the spirit of, I've got to have the peace of the Lord and a spirit of the fear of the Lord inside of me as I move into that and know that this is what the father has, has called me to do. And there are times that I sometimes will make quick decisions, but I'm looking at the peace. I mentioned that just a minute ago, but an impulsive person has a short fuse. Now this is looking at it from a little bit different of a perspective. We start talking about the short fuse here. You know, one of the ways that you can see that can be an expression of anger, where someone who is impulsive uh, can not only react to, not only do something, they're on their own, but they can react to things that are going on around them. And in this short fuse, suddenly blows up and becomes angry. They're angry. Why? Because it's it's going against the way that they see things. Not recognizing that each one of us have our own perspectives. Each one of us can see things from a different way. But a lot of times the fool or the impulsive person will think everybody needs to be like them. You know, as a matter of fact, everybody needs to act like them and respond like them. Many times you'll hear the fools say this. Why can't they why can't they do it this way? Why can't they do it that way? Now I'm not saying everyone who says that is a fool, but I am saying that leads into that that begins to open a door of saying, well what do you mean why can't? Everybody is different. Everybody sees things from a different perspective. The diamond of Yahweh. For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, if you're listening to us on YouTube, uh, in YouTube, there is a, a a Diamond of Yahweh video that I do, and uh, it will explain everything that I'm talking about with regards to this. If you have not watched it, please do, because it's it, it explains a lot of the details and how each one of us will see things from a slightly different perspective. And that's exactly the way that Father designed it to be, is so that we all could be a part of the body, and each part could have its part in the body itself, and every joint supply. Isn't that what the scripture says? Where every joint supplies? Can we all be the same part? No, we can't. 
We have to be different parts. We have to see things from a different perspective. And so I, I, I've, I, I see this a lot, and I myself have been one. I remember years back that one of the ways that, like, why do people act like they do? Why is it that uh, that they they don't they respond in this way? Why why do when you're when you have a heart of love? I've done this many a times. I've gone in to talk to someone or have a conversation with someone, and during the middle of the conversation, I'll be saying something that was from my perspective, this place of me bearing out my heart and laying it down in front of them, and their responses were like, "What?" <laughs> I, I don't understand because I, I'm I'm bearing myself and I'm trying to connect in this deep place with with you and trying to 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 find out, you know, hear from you and hear the perspective that you have. And they had a short fuse with regards to it, came back and told me I was all wrong. They told me I was all wrong because I was not responding the way that they do. I was responding in the way that I normally respond. You following me? You see, in this place where we begin to, to try to lump everybody together in the same way, in the same thing, doesn't work. There is diversity and, and there is a, a body with many different cells and many different parts for a purpose. There is a diamond that has many different facets for a purpose, because because without those facets and without the perspectives that each facet has, the diamond would not be as beautiful as it could be. Just look at this. See the sparkles that are coming as a result of just the moving of it? Now, this is just a crystal uh, diamond I use as, uh, for the purpose of just showing it. But you would not see those sparkles or the colors of the rainbow, if you had not looked at that diamond and saw that it had the many facets. It was the facets that created the true beauty. You following me? But the wise show self-control. I don't need to go back and say any more on that one. I think I pretty well established it in the first verse. Because self-control is that part where, just as we talked about in the end of verse 16, careful scrutiny and meticulous evaluation is characteristic of the righteous. Uh, then it's, and you'll find that in the Mishle itself. Verse 18, in the Mishle, it says this, Simpletons have inherited folly, but the shrewd make knowledge a crown. 18 in the in the passion translation the naive demonstrate a lack of wisdom but the lovers of wisdom are crowned with revelation knowledge now when we talk about naivety or simpleton there are i want i want to make sure that that i'm understood with this because I have known people that were very, very simple people, and and someone else might look at them and say, well, they're naive. And to, an ex to a certain extent, based on the external way of looking at things, I might would even say the same thing about them. They, they seem to be naive, seem to be. The naive in this case are not ones who are in the core part of who they are, simple people who have simple things that they uh, do and are. In other words, they're. it's not because of, of a choice. I'm talking about simple people or simpletons or fools, if you will, or the naive, according to what Dr. Simmons wrote, uh, that I'm, not, I'm I'm talking about those who by choice choose not to know. Those are the naive I'm talking about here. Does that make sense? So you know now you know I'm clear with regards to this. There was a time where I thought years ago, back mainly back when I was a teenager uh, and and young adult. There was a time where I really thought 
that being stupid or ignorant of something kept me from being held or bound to it. No joke. There, I, I, I distinctly remember in my life having those those times and those places where I was where I was thinking that, and I purposefully would stay away from something to not know it. But he, it after that first and second speeding ticket and cops saying, well, I didn't know what the speed limit was. He said, well, ignorance of the law is not, um, is not an excuse. Ignorant of the law, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Well, I started to learn from there, you know, um, but you get where I'm going. It was a purposeful naivety to almost act as if I'm just going to let things go. See, the heart behind that is one who says of themselves, you know, let me just let life happen and I'll respond to it as it happens. Well, that's not what the father has taught me now. And there was a time that I did that. But what the father began to teach me was that I had a part to play in creation, that him and I co-create together him and you and all of us co-create together our life and the pro and, the, and what we go through and the things that we do and the things that happen are because we by our own mouth have set in motion the very act of the things that happen now i know that's a bit deep and i'm going to stop right there on purpose because if I don't leave you with more questions than I do answers, then I'm not doing my job. Because, see, there is there, there is a place where we, Father is calling us. Now, it's funny, I'm, 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 normally when I speak this, I'm, I'm usually kind of hyped up a little bit more what I'm saying right now. But I'm, I hear the Lord saying this in a very gentle, loving tone to me, and I want to relay it to you that way as well, that he has, he has given us responsibility in that place of the things that we say, our own mouth, and those things that come out of our heart are the, are the very things that bring about our course of life. He's calling us to this place of being very careful about what we speak. Come on. I just got done talking about it with verses 16 and 17. Careful scrutiny and meticulous self-evaluation is characteristic of the righteous. In other words, uh, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. In other words, out of your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's funny, I was just in a situation not too long ago that I felt was it was there was the right thing to do. But as I went along with it, I began to discover this place of the peace beginning to leave about that particular thing. And that happens sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that. I can move towards peace. And 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 because sometimes part of it is not just my response. It can be others' responses as well. And things can change in them. And as a result, the Lord will pull me out of that. There was a connection where he was trying to, to bring about a, a blessing to them, but because of their responses to it, it began to, to pull and, and cause me to go the other way. And it was like, no, I heard the Lord saying, okay, pull out there. I don't want you to go any further than what you've already done. You've done exactly what I ask you to do in this situation. Does that mean it was wrong? No. He walked you through a place where Someone else had an opportunity and it was going to be, he was going to use you to allow you to be the one where things could, could flow through, but their choices blocked it. And if it did, and once it did, he pulled me out of that situation. And it was funny because I, I had a dream and the interpretation of the dream, let me just say this. I don't want to give you the whole dream, but let me just say this. In the dream, I was searching for a locker and I've got a book called uh, The Dream the dream. Oh God, I can't believe I can't remember. Uh Divinity? Dream Div It's a it's a book that was written by a couple of Christian guys who goes through and and finds things in scriptures and uh and actually looks at dream interpretation based on the, the the things that were in your dream, and they'll give you scriptures that are associated with it. 
And uh, under this particular one, when I went and looked at Locker, Locker was the heart. And the scripture they had connected to that was, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. It's like, okay, Lord, thank you. Thank you for not only in the day season as I'm trying to walk through this, but Father, even in the night season, you're teaching me and showing me the path that I need to take. And that was all I needed. And I was I, I was able to back out of that situation from that point. And and I'm glad I did. <laughs> glad I did. Nothing's happened. Everything's still good. Everything's still, I pray blessings upon them. I don't need to be a part of that any longer. So that's what I'm talking about, the righteous being crowned with revelation knowledge. The naive demonstrate that lack of wisdom because they choose to be that way. I'm talking that's why I'm talking about the the naive that choose to be naive. But the lovers of wisdom are crowned with revelation knowledge. Father will teach us that even in situations that we think are right, just like the one I just expressed, and it comes to a place where he it, it's not right any longer, he will walk you through it. But don't look at it as a mistake. Please don't look at it as a mistake. Everything, all things work together to the good. He just brought you through the place of learning how to listen to him even more, even more so if it's a dream. Because he's showing you something in the night season, just like David used to cry out for. He said, teach me, Lord, even in the night season, that our dreams can express the, the, the teaching and the loving and the understanding and the wisdom of God. I don't care whether you call it a good dream or a bad dream. <laughs> I've had some that have shook me and woke me up. But when I found, when I went before the Lord, asked him about it, he led me to the interpretation of that dream. And I was like, oh, yeah, Lord, do it, do it. Because the negative dream actually had a very beautiful interpretation, completely opposite of what the dream was talking about. Again, now we're looking at dreams only from one perspective. If it caused fear in us in the dream, then it's a fearful dream. Not necessarily. It could be the spirit of the fear of the Lord that you're sensing. And he's trying to show you, hey, pay attention to this. I want to show you something. I want you to see something. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Okay. Verse 19. Let's continue on. Verse 19 in the Mishle says this. Evildoers will grovel before good people, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous one. That's where I got the name of, of this particular. And truth be told, told, I wanted to kind of do verses 18 and 19 together anyway. The uh, Lord took me on another little path. But let's go back. I'm going to read 18 and 19, but I'm going to read it together. Because in this particular case, these two verses coincide with one another. Verse 19 speaks of those people in verse 18. So let's look at it from that perspective. Verse 18 in the uh, Passion Translation says, The naive demonstrate a lack of wisdom, but the lovers of wisdom are crowned with revelation knowledge. Evil ones will pay tribute to good people. Evil ones relate back to the naive. Good people talk about the lovers of wisdom. And they eventually become, eventually come to be servants of the godly. So let's stop and look at this just a little bit more. There was an interesting part of this that really grabbed me, and I'm going to get a little deep here in the Hebrew, and uh, 
because I want to I want to kind of kind of show you something that begins to open up some deeper expressions of this. Um, don't always do this in this class, but uh, I usually do this in our School of Living Letters. And if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love for you to be a part. Uh, just go to our website. There's a link below and you can you can join us there. But if I look at this from the Mishle, it says in verse nine, it says evildoers will grovel before good people. In the Hebrew, they hear it's the Hebrew word ra'im. Ra'im has a root word. The yod mem at the end, or the im part of a ra'im, means multiplicity. So it's talking about many evil doers. Hence the plurality of the of the interpretation or the uh, translation of it here. But the root word of this is the Hebrew word ra. Ra is the Hebrew word for evil, and it's actually spelt resh ayin in the Hebrew letters themselves. Now I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, uh, "Go ahead and go a little bit deeper in this," because I wanna. I wanna share with you something that's kind of a mystery and a really cool aspect of the Hebrew itself. In Hebrew, there are biletter roots and triletter roots. Now, what do I mean by that? Some of them are two letters. Some of them are three letters. A three-letter root is most of the root words are in Hebrew. And they are actually called root. If you have only two letters, it's actually known as a seed. So it's, I call it a, and it just for simplicity of being able to describe it, I call it a seed root and a root. So a three letter is a root. A two letter is a seed root word. Okay. You following me? So why do, why am I making the distinction there? Why is that necessary? Well, if you think about a root, a root is something where the seed itself has busted open and it now the life that was hidden on the inside comes out. It begins to grow inside of the dirt and it begins to shoot a root down into the ground. The potential of the seed when a seed remains just a seed is nothing more than that potential. You following me? I've got to say, if I had a seed in my hand right now, that seed would be nothing more than potential. But if I took that seed, planted it in the ground, watered it, and it began to bust open and it began to grow, that seed that was potential has now become actual. Are you with me so far? So when we look, look at the Hebrew word ra, which is the Hebrew word for evil, we see a biletter root or a biletter seed root. In other words, ra is nothing more than potential. It does not become actual until it's acted upon. Do you get the secret there? The things that we call evil, according to the, 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 the mysteries hidden in the word, are nothing more than potential, and they require us to act upon them to become actual. Now, what's the scripture behind that one, brother? Well, let me share it with you. Does not the, not, does not the scripture say that when sin is planted, it begins to grow, and when it comes to full, and that's a bad, bad uh, paraphrase of it, uh, and uh, Jen, you might could help me out with finding the scripture there, and I can uh, share it with the folks on the on the uh, YouTube. Uh, but it goes on to say that that when sin is fully grown, it brings death. Right. So we're talking about a seed that grows, and then it brings about the place of death. Well, Tov or good is who our Father is. Father is always good. You following me? So I found this interesting where it says that uh, Ra'im, evildoers, will grovel before good people. Ra is only two letters. It's nothing more than potential. Tov is a three-letter root, and it literally means just that. It's good. It's full. It's complete. It lacks nothing. Father is the only one who is good. And he is good. You see, this whole thing, when I've talked about the good and the bad and so on, it's on the premise that we think that God isn't necessarily always good. 
He's a punishing God. No, he's not. God is always good. It is an immutable, unchangeable fact. God is good, period. We've said that for years. And I've almost think we've gotten to the place where we've allowed it to be just something that we say, the naive, without something that we really know, the wise. Following me there? Let's stop. Holy Spirit, I ask those that are here today, those that are listening to this on YouTube, let them stop and think about this place of the immutable, unchangeable fact that you are always good. You always love us. Those are two immutable, unchangeable things about God. He is good and he is love, period. So simple, but yet so profound, so deep when we really stop to think about it and we begin to evaluate ourselves from that perspective and how we have seen things. What do you see? How do you see it? So you see, R. Hirsch in the, in the Michelet said it this way, and I love the way he said it and how he connected verses 18 and uh, 19 here. He said this, the cleverness inherit in, inherent in the shoe in the um in the shrewd or the good person is his astute observation of everything going on around him and the monitoring of his own steps. In other words, the smart person, the wise person is the shrewd and good person who by observation, let's go back to what we said in the beginning. Careful scrutiny and meticulous self-evaluation is a characteristic of the righteous. Let's go down to verse 18 and 19 again. And what R. Hirsch says here, the wise person is the shrewd and good person who by his ob astute observation, in other words, deep observation of what's going on, on everything going on around him and the monitoring of his own steps, watching those things around and watching himself. Actually, I would like to almost flip those two because the first place we need to do is to watch our own steps. And then, and then at the same time, watching those things that are going on around us. In other words, my choices start with me. They don't start with people around me. They start with me. And so I want to monitor my own steps and make sure my own steps are ordered of, and my own steps are ordered of the Lord, but I want to continue to walk on them because they're my choice. I choose to continue to walk on those steps. Because, why? Because I love the Lord. Not because I have to. You get that? It's not about having to. I Sorry, I'm biting my tongue right now. <laughs> I don't know whether I want to say what I'm about ready to say. <laughs> so now you're seeing it in action. <laughs> James 1.15, uh, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Thank you. What it's talking about is the seed that is born, well, lust is conceived. It begins to grow, brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, the fruit comes in, then it brings forth death. So there you go. Thank you for the distraction on that, because I don't think I needed to say what I wanted to say. So there you go, walking walk through, and I didn't do that on purpose, I promise. I know that seems kind of perfectly placed, but it wasn't on purpose. But there's something stirring up inside of me, and the Lord says, no, no, no not necessary. Monitoring our own steps, watching the things that we do, and at the same time, watching those things that are going on around us. Sometimes when we're quiet, we can really begin to see a lot of things that we would have never seen before. Now, there's times when I like to get into deep conversations, and I love talking with people. Don't get me wrong. And there's times with that quietness as well. Thank you, Father. Now, this last verse was one that, that kind of... Just, just I, I, I was having a little bit of difficulty in this one, and I want to make sure that I, uh, I want to make sure that I articulate this well, because I still think there's an even deeper uh, revelation here than than what I found. And truth be told, that's true with all of this. That uh, I'm giving you what the Lord has given me thus far, but there's still so much more. Hence, the reason for our engagement at the end of this today's class. 
where we can ex where we can share together. And I learned so much from all of you here in this class that it's not even funny. We grow together as one. Verse 20 says this, a poor person will be hated even by his fellow, but the lovers of a rich man are many. That almost sounds a little bit crazy, doesn't it? But let's look at what the Passion Translation says. The poor are disliked even by their neighbors, but everyone wants to get close to the wealthy. Kind of gives us the same thing we got from the Michele as well. And it's like, okay, well, how does that, how does that work together? The, uh, the poor here, there's something neat inside the Michele and inside the Hebrew here. The, actual word that is used in the Mishle here is the Hebrew word rosh, and it's resh and shin. And it's got, for those of you that uh, know the vowel sounds, it's got a comets uh, below it. That, that gives it the ah sound. So it's rosh. Rosh is a biletter root or seed root. It's only two letters long. So remember what I just talked about just a few minutes ago? It speaks about the place of Potential, not actual. Selah, right there for just a minute. Stop and think about it for just a minute. If it's a two-letter root, it's speaking about the place of potential. It's, cry it's crying out and saying poverty or being poor is a potential thing. I can be poor in... Finances. See, we always go to financial aspects, but the truth is, is that there's there is there's more than just poverty in the in in finances. There's a poverty mindset. There's a place of poverty where all we think about, and and it's that Hebrew word rosh there, the reshin. It's a place of potential. That same person who has the poverty mindset can walk out of that place of the poverty mindset because the actual root of that word, even though it's using only a two-letter word expression of it here, the actual root of poor is rush. It's resh, vav, and shin. So it's a three, three-letter. Now, I know some of you may be asking, well, how does that work with the Beatitudes? You know, those of you who are a poor in spirit or um, uh, the, the meek shall inherit the earth and so on. There are many scriptures that have been used to, to kind of make poverty glorified. And that poverty in the sense of that is should never be glorified. I don't care what my bank account has in it. I can tell you this right here and right now with full confidence because the Lord has shown me my treasury room in the treasury rooms of heaven. I am the richest man in the world. Regardless of whether you see it from my bank account or not, it's irrelevant. I know that the Father, what the Father has given me, and I know there is so much inside of my treasury room that that I, do, I can't even express or explain to you because it goes beyond my comprehension. And it's beyond a place where I can actually see right here, right now, at this moment. In other words, there is a vanishing point inside of my inside of my um, treasury room, which means that I can only just see so far. But if I begin to walk in the direction of something, guess what? I begin to see that there's actually more and more and more. Kind of the picture of, uh, if you guys go with me, anybody that's watched the uh, the movie with, oh, what's that name of that movie? Treasures, the... National treasure, the first national treasure. You remember when they found the Solomon's gold and they turned on the lights? And the the if you've watched the movie, if you have, if you haven't watched the movie, I'm probably giving you a poor analogy. But when they when they lit up the lights, this this room was cavernous, and you could only see to a certain point, but you could tell that there was more beyond it. That's exactly the way that the Lord showed me my treasury room. And the truth is, is that you have a treasury room just like that. You do. So guess what? You're the richest person in the world, just like I am. 
So it's not a matter of what I have in my bank account. It's a matter of recognizing, Father, you have already given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. There's not half things. There's not many things or miniature things. It's all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You talk about a place of peace and of rest and of faith in the Father, knowing he's already provided it for me. That's a whole other teaching, and I don't want to continue on with that from there. But one of the key things as I was looking into, um, into this really came to this place of, of the poor. And what it's saying here is that the poor will be hated even by his own fellow. In other words, a lot of times with a poverty mindset, what we do is we become very selfish. And those things that we have, we want to hold on to. And if you're in a group or community of a lot of people who are poor, that's a lot of what happens. It's it's like, this is mine. This is mine. And I don't want anybody else to have it. There's very little sharing. There's very little, because all that you have is so little that you want to, to gain more. But the little is not in the fact of what you have. The little is actually up in here. And so a, a, a poor person will be hated by his neighbor, but the lovers of a rich man are loved by both the rich and the poor. Why? Because there's potential for there, for there to be at least some charity that's given to the poor as a result of this. Part of the reason I'm bringing this up really has little to do with a poverty mindset and a place of the financial aspect of this. In the Hebrew, I'm going to read this to you in Hebrew, and I'm going to kind of go back uh, over this. In the Hebrew, evildoers will grovel before good people. In the Hebrew is actually this, Shachu Ra'im Lefni Tovim. Shachu Ra'im Lefni Tovim. What does that mean? Shahu is the place of the groveling. Grovel were the evildoers, the Ra'im. So it's shach, Shahu uh, Ra'im, evildoers will grovel. Lafni Tovim. Now, if I break those down and I separate those Hebrew words and create two sentences, Shahu Ra'im, evildoers will grovel. Lafni Tovim before good people, right? Look at this, because the Lamed in front of the Hebrew word Lafni is actually a, um, I don't know why my brain's going blank. It's a, um, <laughs> ah, thank you, Lord. I think I'm, I've been so wrapped up in this that I'm, um, prefix, thank you. It's a prefix before the Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word there is Hanim. Now, for those of you that have been in our classes, you know exactly where I'm going with this. For those of you that haven't, and for those of you that are listening in here, Hanim is the Hebrew word for face, or more specifically, because of the im on the end of it, the yod bem on the end of that Hebrew word, it means faces. That same word is the Hebrew word for the presence of God. It's the exact same word. Some cases it's translated as face or faces, and in other places, that same Hebrew word is translated as the presence of God. All right? So, breaking this down, the lamed in front of the pani, in this case, lapni is the way it's pronounced, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of... Anyway, just follow along with me. The lamed in front of it, the prefix, actually means that place of learning or understanding something, or two or four. All right? It can be, uh, uh, like in this case, it's before. So it's talking about this place of position. But lamed is a letter that speaks of learning and teaching. So if I break that down by la, la that lamed in front, and then panim, I'm learning in the presence of God. So when I break it down, it kind of gives me exactly what 
this whole thing is talking about. Shahu Raim, evildoers grovel. Lapni, Lapni Tovim, but good people um, stand before the presence of God. You see the difference there? How in just a, a, just a moment of looking into the heart behind this, and really this is just from the Spirit of God, looking at the letters and looking at the vowel sounds that are attached to them and how they begin to reveal a deeper place of what this is saying here. Now, I know I've gone back from verse 20 back to verse 19, but I did that on purpose because in thinking about this, so some of you might be a little confused because you're like, wait a minute, you were on verse 20 a minute ago, and now you went back to verse 19, didn't you? <laughs> Holy Spirit led me there, and so I went there. So my apologies. Now, hopefully that makes sense uh, in how I was going back to verse 19 because I was trying to use that to describe verse 20. Poor people grovel, but wise people, those who learn and understand from the heart of the Father and from the presence of God are, are tovim. They're good. They're an expression of good. Remember, tov. Tov is the Hebrew word for good. And so when I say God is good, it's God is tov. Yeshua himself even said that. Remember, he was talking to the Pharisees, Sadducees. And they said, good teacher. And he said, don't call me good. There is only one who is good, and that is my father. Right? So we begin to see why this is the case. Now, I know this, this, this particular one, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. This particular section of, of verses have gotten, gotten very deep and taken us very deep into this. And some of you may be a little angry with some of the things that I said. I hope not, because I want, I, I really pray that the Lord would open up the understanding of your heart. May the, eye, may the eyes of your heart being enlightened can understand the width, the breadth, the height, and the depth of the love that God has for you. Because this is it's it's showing us this place and saying, hey, there's more here beside what you have seen, beside what you've known and always have known. There's more there. Come, hear me, follow me, look into my word. You don't have to follow us. You can follow anybody, anyone who the Spirit of God leads you to, to take you and walk you through this. Just get before the Lord, listen to him, and then begin to see what he's saying. Because he has a treasure inside of you that he wants to unlock. The unlocking is not that he has, he is the key. He is the door. Yeshua is the door, but he is the key and he is the door. But what he's doing is also, by the blood of Yeshua, unlocking that door and letting you stand before it where you open the door. You tear the veils away because he wants you to see what's actually inside of you. As you see what Father has already placed inside of you, you begin to operate in this place of the trust of God. That in no matter what, in no matter what situation, you trust him, you have confidence in his word. Complete and utter confidence in and knowing, knowing what he is saying, and knowing that he has already given you all things. So it's from this place, because I'm going to wrap it up here, from this place that I speak this blessing over every one of you. Shalom. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face panav in that particular uh, sentence, but it's panim, it's his face. May his face shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his presence, panav elecha, his face, his presence, his countenance towards you and give you peace. Blessings and shalom.